Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I sent out the lesson, like always, just via email to the members of the church. If you are visiting this morning and you would like that to be sent out to you, uh, just notice the person on your left or your right and they can forward that on to you. you. Uh, my first question, just starting off the sermon this morning, is have you ever done something and you look back at it and you realize, man, that was a complete waste of time? Yeah. There's so many times I do that in my life, especially pretty much happens every day. Every single day, every time when I'm deciding what do I want for lunch. I go around and I think, oh, man, I want this, I want that. I walk around for 15, 20 minutes and I end up buying the same thing I do every single day. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know, even for you, I hate going to the doctors because I, I feel like it's just going to be a waste of time. I'm going to go there and they're just going to tell me, go home, drink some water, um, you know, have a bit of rest. Like, man, I could have done that. I don't need you to tell me. That. Yep, every time you call immigration, well, go check the website after two hours waiting on the phone. It's like, gosh, it feels like a complete waste of time. Yeah. Yo, because we don't like wasting our time, but sometimes actually as Christians, we can do that. I think one of the most unproductive things Christians do is we fight for things that are already ours. Think about it. We pray for the harvest when the Bible says that it is plentiful. We struggle with guilt or slavery to sin when the Bible says that you are set free and you already have a new life. Yeah. And the last one I think is we hope for victory when it, it has already been gifted to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, it says this, But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What I love about this scripture, it says that he gives it to you. Not that he gave it to you or that he could give it to you, but that means he is continuously giving you victory. That it is already ours. We have victory in our hands, but it doesn't always mean that we are going to win the goal, right? You know, sometimes we can let the easiest victories slip through our fingers. Have you guys ever seen um, those videos where there's somebody that's right next to the front, maybe they're racing other people, they're right next to the, the finish line and they start celebrating, and they start boasting, yeah. and yet somebody else passes them at the rack last second? Yes. You know, they had the victory, they had it, it was theirs, but they let it slip in their hands because mm -hmm. they were focused not on the right thing. Mm -hmm. I know me and Timoteo felt this a little bit when we had our retreat uh, earlier this year. We are playing darts. And we had this game, you know, you have to aim for the 20 or hit the 30 or whatever. And Tegan hasn't thrown a dart in her life, comes up, and she wants to play. And she beats me into the table. <laughs> and uh, it, it's taken me months to tell that story. I, it, it, I, I've had that. I've written it down a couple times. Like, no, I ain't preaching it that way. But uh, we, we let the victory sleep through our hands. And we practiced, like, for a couple days, actually. <laughs> but, you know, knowing that the victory is ours is one thing. But we have to learn how to make it across the finish line. Mm. It is ours. It doesn't mean that we don't have to work for it. Well, how do we actually get across the finish line? We're going to look how a king brought victory to his kingdom. If you are turning in your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to read here in a very short story of what happened with this predicament, this circumstances where it seemed like failure was about to happen, but one king made all the difference. So, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to be starting in verse 2. So, jumping straight into it, it says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, uh, Ammonites uh, with some of the Mennonites, um, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazan Tamar, that is E. In uh, En Gedi, sorry. A large Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now we're just going to skip into the end and see what actually happened in between. We'll get to that later. But we're going to go all the way down to verse 29. It says, The fear of the Lord came on all of the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the em em excuse me, enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. You, you see the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie, you're like, wow, how did that actually happen? Mm. There is this vast army coming to Jehoshaphat and against Israel, and you're going to see, he's going to actually say, hey, this is an army we could never fight, we can never win, but at the end of the chapter that God has given them peace on all sides. Wow. 
Well, the Bible at least gets us to understand when Jehoshaphat the king heard this news of an impeding war, the very first thing he does, the very first thing on his heart was to go and pray to God. He didn't even think about uh, getting the prophet to do it. No, there wasn't enough time. He's like, I'm going to pray here, but I'm going to proclaim a fast all in Israel. Sometimes we ask people to pray for us before we even pray for ourselves. Jehoshaphat's like, no, I'm not asking anybody else. I need to make sure that I have my heart set on God. Come on, Sean. Yo, if trouble comes your way, instead of jumping from house to house, the best thing to do is to seek God in prayer and have him take over the situation. See, what the difference is between victory and defeat was prayer. I know I said this a couple weeks ago about how if you're talking to somebody who truly understands the power of prayer, it's, it's quite rare. You know, if you're straining to have to achieve a victory in your life, you see someone else is successful, and you're like, man, I've been trying really hard every day to focus on this. Yeah. And they said, well, hey, the only difference between me and you is prayer. Ooh. You wouldn't believe it. At first, you'd be surprised. Wait, what? Then you'd be a little bit annoyed, probably. You're saying, that's it? No, 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 that can't be it. No, what is your secret? I know prayer, does, that's not the difference. Mm. People don't really understand prayer. Well, how many of us really believe this? We can tell that the world understands the, the, that prayer is useful, but they don't really accept it. I know previously, I was reading this study in like a psychological study or uh, for society or something. And uh, this, this woman wrote an article and she was pretty much stating how it's important to our mental health to have a time of reflection. A time that you wake up every day and you go off to a quiet place and you just think out loud and you get out your worries and everything. And by the end of it, I was like, I was kind of mad. I was like, this girl's talking about prayer, but she doesn't want to accept it. She was literally saying, you got to do it every day. got to speak out loud. Get it off your heart. I'm like, what the heck is this? The, the, the world knows that prayer is important, but they're just trying to get rid of God. Wow. That's kind of like, you know, it's like, this doesn't even make any sense. That's like making phone calls only when your phone is dead. I was like, you're, you're not even actually even speaking to anybody. Mm -hmm. But see, the world understands that prayer is important, but they just will not accept it. Mm -hmm. I believe that... The world and the spiritual world knows that it's beneficial, but we don't really understand the power of prayer. How can we see that? It's because people, we don't see people going out there and just putting on their heart that they want to be dedicated and become a prayer warrior. You know, I heard this story um, about, let's just name them Bob and Bill. Uh, Bob and Bill were walking in a field and they saw that they, they kind of started to notice that they're, they're, they're in like a fenced area. They're walking in a field, now they notice a fenced area. And out of nowhere, Bob sees this huge bull running straight towards them. They, so Bob and Bill, they start running away, but they both notice, hey, we're not going to make it out of here. So Bob turns to Bill, knowing that he's a Christian. He says, Bob, Bill, please, please, you've got to say a prayer. He's like, me? No, I, I can't say it. We, we're not going to make it. He's like, what? we need you to say a prayer. He's like, okay, well, I haven't really prayed that much. The only prayer that I remember is my father saying this. So he starts praying, oh Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> your prayers before you eat and your prayers of, you know, uh, guide my soul before I sleep, wake me up. Like, those are not always going to make you have victory. Yeah. We have to learn how to have deep prayers. Your simple Sunday school prayers aren't always going to cut it. So this lesson is going to dig into... How are we going to get what's already ours, the victory that God's given us, through the power of prayer? Through the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to start a series of victory series. Ooh. We're going to go in through the Bible, or what are different ways that we can get the victory that's already ours? And the first one we're going to be talking about is prayer. So my title for my lesson this morning is Victory Through Prayer. Come on, Sean. Point number one, prioritize prayer. So we're going to see the first key of victory for Jehoshaphat in Israel is just in verse 3. We read this again, but in verse 3 in, in chapter 20. Alarmed Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. What I really love about this is prayer was not some afterthought or some last ditch effort. It was his first response. He called everyone to fast, but for him, he's like, I'm the one that needs to go out and pray. 
He was resolved. I love that word. Undeterred. And what everybody else was saying that they needed to do, we need to prepare. We need to get the army ready. We need to call people and, and arm everyone. No, he's like, I'm resolved to go inquire of the Lord. This statement of complete faith it was just awesome because he had it in his heart that this was going to work. He's, he's like already looked at the army. He's like, that's not going to work. Why, why even bother and waste my time there? I, I need to go and talk to God. Have you ever been so confident in something in your life as Jehoshaphat was here in prayer? I know whenever I feel like that, that's probably when something's about to go wrong. <laughs> whenever I'm, I'm really confident in something. I remember uh, when I first got to Sydney uh, five years ago. And I actually never really took a bus in my life. I lived in L.A. You drive everywhere. Or I had my little bike, you know, but never really took a bus. And uh, I actually invited um, Esther, our sister who's back in, in, in Sydney, to a, um, an event where we had like music going on in the church. And uh, I've never been in the city, really. So when she's like, hey, how do I get there? I'm like, um, just get to the city and jump on any single bus. It will take you there. And just make sure it's going this way. And she believed me. And uh, I tell my brother this, and he's like, wait, what? You told her to jump on any bus? I'm like, yeah, they all go the same way, right? And he calls her like the next minute, no, jump off right away and jump on this bus. And, uh, you know, I, I was so confident, but I, I had no idea. What it was. But it was awesome just to see this king. He was so confident that there was no other way of getting victory other than just going to God. Yeah. See, prayer needs to be our first response not our last ditch effort. We can't look at prayer that way anymore. I know I heard about in a story in a church saying um, that a, a pastor came into a church where there was difficult situations going on there. And the pastor said, hey, okay, we're going to have a season of prayer. And one of the leaders came up and they said, well, wow, has it gotten that bad? Just his response, meaning you only pray when it gets bad. The, the pastor was like, no, this is what we should be, have been doing anyways. That's why we're seeing failures, because this hasn't been happening. Mm -hmm. See, prayer is not one of those things that we should only go to when something horrific brings us to our knees. Mm -hmm. It should be something where we do every single time that there's a situation in our life. We should go into it immediately, whatever's, whatever situation that we are going into. Well, we can look at it. Well, why doesn't this happen naturally? I believe that there's two reasons that we don't automatically go to prayer when bad things happen or when anything comes into our life. I think the first one is that we haven't learned to do that in anything else. Meaning, when something even good is happening to your life, is your first thing to do is go and thank God. I'm not talking about just, oh, okay, hey, I thanked him once, let it be the end of it, God, thank you. You know, people say that, oh, thank God this happened. And then that, that's it. They, they don't actually go and proclaim things to God. Think if you did that for your, for your relationships. Somebody does something awesome for you that you've been asking for, whatever, like you're, you talk to your family members and they bought you a car and the first thing you say, okay, thank you, Sean. And that's it. That's the only endeavor that they hear. Like that, that's, that's how we treat God sometimes. See, it's not like you're expecting it, like you do something good for someone. It's not like you're expecting it, but you're kind of expecting it. <laughs> right? It's kind of the same thing for God. Yeah, he did this out of the, gracious, uh, the grace of his heart and the, the generosity of his heart. But why, why don't we go to God first thing when he answers one of our prayers? So I think if we're not going to do that with everything in our life, we're not going to do it when bad things happen in our life as well. We've got to train ourselves. No matter what it is, we go to God first. Yeah. I think the second reason is, is that we don't actually believe that it works. Mm. We don't go to God immediately because we, in our hearts we don't believe it works. There's a story about this uh, preacher, and his daughter always noticed that before he came up and preached, he would always bow his head down, and then he would start. And the young daughter came up, Dad, Dad, why, why do you always bow your head before you preach? He says, well, honey, um, I, I make sure that I'm asking God for strength that I can do a good sermon. She said, well, why doesn't he ever answer your prayers then? <laughs> Cut to the heart. But sometimes, right, we can feel like the preacher. Like, I, I, I pray, but it doesn't seem like my prayers work. The Bible says, uh, well, pray, uh, the prayer of a righteous man is pure, uh, powerful and effective. Am I not righteous? I don't know. But I think sometimes we, we don't really 
we start doubting prayer in general because God hasn't answered one or two of our prayers, or at least the way that we wish he would. And then we start thinking to ourselves, wow, I wish God would just answer my prayers. I wonder if God ever thinks to himself, wow, I wish they would just believe in prayer. Mm -hmm. People sometimes pray things that they don't really, uh, they, they pray things that aren't really, uh, they don't really have faith that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. The Bible actually says, hey, let it be done according to your faith. See, prayer is a vehicle, but faith is kind of like the petrol. Mm -hmm. If you're giving God a car to get you somewhere, but you didn't put any gas in, in, in the car, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. God's like, you're, you're praying things that you don't actually believe. Mm -hmm. So we got to start thinking, like, don't get in the habit of asking God for things that you are not ready to receive. Mm -hmm. That you don't have the faith to receive. If you're going to bring it to God... It better be coming from your heart, not just your lips. Mm -hmm. These better be things that you really, really want because God is attentive to your prayers. See, we'll start prioritizing prayers when first we start doing that with everything in our life. Whether it's good or bad, we bring it to God. God, you are my Father. You are the one in control. I just want to bring everything to you. And the second thing, when we start to prioritize prayers and when we start to believe it, God I believe what I say that you're going to do. I know somebody was asking me previously, of, hey, what's the difference when you have a goal in the church and it doesn't really work out? What are you, what are you supposed to do? How, do you, how do you get your head around goals? Well, my understanding, my response is, if I have a goal, I'm going to pray about it. And therefore, it's now a spiritual goal because I believe God's going to answer my prayers. So it's not a physical goal anymore for me. It's not like this is what Sean wants and Sean has said. No, I brought it to prayer, and I believe God's going to answer my prayers, so therefore, I'm going after my goals. It's not this pushing me anymore, it's pulling me to it now, because I'm like, I can't wait until God answers these goals. It's exciting. Mm. And so that's what I really want to encourage everyone here with, is the first challenge is start praying like you believe it will happen. Fine. Pray for it, and prepare yourself to receive it. Mm. Too many times we pray one thing, and we prepare for failure. Now we need to pray for it and then prepare to receive our prayers. So we did skip all the way down from the beginning to the end, but we're going to jump into the middle a bit and examine Jehoshaphat's prayer that's going to give us a little bit of an insight of why God brought victory to his people with Jehoshaphat's prayer. So we're just going to read here in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. So this is his prayer. He says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Yeah, I love this prayer because I can really relate to this. Yeah, we can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. That's an awesome prayer, right? But I love when you get to this moment, when you get to this point in life that you actually, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. Wow. Because that's awesome because then you better, when you pray this type of prayer, you better now just sit back and watch God do his miracles. Yeah. It's exciting when, that, when you get to that point in your life. Because this is exactly what God does. He says, Joseph, I just want you to sit down and watch me do something. Mm -hmm. Drop down to verse 15 and 17. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judea and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow... Um, excuse me, tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing out from Pazil, and you will find uh, them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeril. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, but go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Literally, this is what God says to them. He's, he, Jehoshaphat and everybody, hey, we can't do anything. We don't know what to do. He's like, hey, this, this is not even your battle. I just want you to show up, stand firm in my strength, and just watch me deliver. Let, watch me fight your battles. And Jehoshaphat, he had so much faith in the Lord's words that it was going to happen. Let's see what he does, actually, with the king, or with his army. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tenu. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. 
After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out to the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. He believed it so much. He doesn't get everybody here handing a sword and a spear and a shield to everyone. I wonder if he's handing out trumpets instead. Drums, flutes. He's like, guys, we're not going to have to fight. God said he was going to bring us victory, and therefore this is what we're going to do. We're just going to sing. Before we even see the victory, I want you guys to start singing. You know, if there was a moment that I would love to relive in the Old Testament, I think this would be my new moment. How powerful that song would have been. I think it would have been even more powerful because you know there would have been some in there that were singing out of fear. Give thanks to the Lord. Right, they would have been shouting and like screaming out like, gosh, is this really going to work? Um, you know, I, I know I might have been like that too, but that, that would have been so powerful to walk up there with complete faith, looking at your left and your right and just yeah. seeing for the victory that God's going to give you. See, in prayer, we must understand what is our ability and what is not our ability. Joseph had said, hey, I don't know what to do. I'm not going to be able to win this. And so he was giving it over to God. See, when we face the former, what's not our ability, we must have the faith that allows us to stand to an unstoppable force and sing praise to God before we even see the victory. See, do not break the line just because the army is coming closer. You have to trust in God. Again, we can pray one thing, one moment, show up. God, I believe in you, and then prepare for failure. See, some people quote, well, about, you know, the Bible says that a, a heart deterred, or excuse me, a hope deferred makes a heart sick. Well, guys, don't, don't misquote that scripture. That doesn't apply to faith and prayer. Stop making excuses that you are guarding your heart. In reality, you are accepting faithlessness. Stop guarding your heart from faith and prayer. That's not what that scripture means. It doesn't mean that, okay, well, hey, God might not show up. No, 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 no. You need to still have faith in your prayers. Stop giving God a deadline. Stop saying, hey, that, that God, you have, to, you have to work in my time frame. It doesn't work that way. That's not how servitude works. I know we can get anxious or we can get nervous of what's going to happen with our yeah. business, with our jobs, with all these different things. But we are the servants, not God. Yeah. And he's going to fight our battles. See, a sick heart is much better than a hard heart. When you stop believing that your prayers are going to work, because you're guarding your heart from faith, that's not going to ever work out for you. See, there are some things, again, that we pray for, that yes, that are without our ability, we can't do it. But there are some things that we pray for that are not outside our ability. They're just outside our comfort zone. Meaning we can actually do it. And we have to be honest in those situations where it's not God. There's battles that God puts in our lives that he's going to fight. There's other battles going to put in our lives that we have to fight. And we can't just go to God and, and get him to take that away from us. I know there, there was a church one day. It said um, that this church needed to raise $5,000. So they had a guest speaker come on in. And they told him the, the situation and said, hey, we have to raise $5,000 uh, for us to... to to be able to keep, continue running and support other churches. And he's like, uh, okay, well, what do we do? Well, we just want you to pray that it's gonna happen. He's like, pray? Um, no, I'm not gonna pray until everybody in the congregation gives what's out of their pocket right now in cash. Like, what do you mean? He's like, well, have you guys given yet? No. Okay, well then that's what we need to do. We, we can be the answer to our prayers. Literally sits there for about 30 minutes People were just waiting for him to, to do a sermon and pray. He doesn't do it, and then they start doing it. They start giving money. By the end of that day, they raised $8,000. Mm -hmm. They were the answer to their own prayer. It was within their ability, but they just wanted to bring it to God because it's so much easier to pass it along. Mm -hmm. See, again, that there are some times that God's going to help us realize that we are the answer to our own prayers. And other times when we're going to realize that we are nowhere enough. When Jesus told Paul, Peter... That he was going to deny him three times, Peter quickly and boldly stood his ground, saying, No, I'm not going to do it. Peter thought he was strong enough to avoid such a fall, 
We realize that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was, and he fell. But I wonder what it would have been different if Peter, his first response was to go and pray. What if Peter realized, hey, actually, if Peter, if Jesus is telling me this, maybe I'm not strong enough. What if Peter, instead of just saying, I will do it, he went out and prayed to God. What a different that would be. See, my last challenge is we need to stand on the strength in prayer, guys. Then we need to rely on God's strength and not our own when it's not our ability. This battle was always God's to fight when Israel was facing all these armies. There are some battles that God has put in your life for him to fight, but you are failing because you ran out in front of God. Right? And Jehoshaphat was brave and he had courage. He's like, no matter what, I see the army coming. I'm just going to, if it said that he was... Um, Undeterred to go and fight them anyways. He had bravery and courage. That would have led to the death of everyone. Mm. But instead, he went on and just stood on the strength of prayer. This fight was always God's. But he had to bring it to God. So what fights are you trying to fight on your own? Which ones are in your ability, but you just keep bringing it to God? Find out which fights you need to fight and which ones you need to pass on to God. Point number three in our last point, focus on the Father. So we're going to see what else we can learn from his prayer. In verse 12, he says this as well. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love this one in the Old Testament. Is there any other verse that you can relate more to this one? Yeah. You know? Come on. And you know it's true because it rhymes, right? <laughs> we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Right? It has to be true. It rhymes. It's kind of like the same role. Whenever somebody says something twice but in reverse, that's super wise. Think of it. It's not the size of the dog, but it's the, excuse me, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. That's always wise, no matter when you reverse it. You can make up anything, right? It's not how many churches are in the chair. Excuse me, it's not about how many chairs are in the churches, but how many churches are in the chairs. Uh. Are there factions? I made that up. Yeah, so it still sounds pretty wise. <laughs> it's the same thing. Like, this, this, this has Come to be right. Time. It's grinding. It's awesome. But in all seriousness, he says, we can't do it. We're keeping our eyes on you. And why? Because, see, God, after we become a Christian, he rises us to heights that scare. How far we've gone and how much we're trying to just keep up with his plans, it's kind of, it gets scary. And the best thing to do is not look down and just keep walking on the path decided by God. Prayer is that time where you have your eyes on God. See, Satan, how does he instill fear in us? He instills fear in us by what we see. You think about the account of David and Goliath, that that whole army was traumatized and stood in fear because of what they saw. The Bible actually exclaimed, hey, it could have been anybody that could have took down Goliath, but David was the only one faithful enough to do it. That he had his eyes on God during that time. He says, God has already given me victory in so many areas of my life. Why wouldn't he give me victory in this area? He had his eyes on God when he was facing his mm -hmm. battles. So when we focus on God, we needed, when Jehoshaphat was focused on God, he reminded himself of who God was. Earlier in his prayers, he said, Lord, in verse 6, the God of our ancestors are you not the God of who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands, and no one can withstand you. When he had his eyes focused on God in this prayer, he started to understand who God was and the power that he had in his hands. Have you ever had someone, though, look at you, but not really look at you? Meaning, they're looking at you, but they're not really looking at you. Where, like, they, they're, they're making eye contact with you, on, but their eyes are, and their mind are just in somewhere out in space. And some of you might be thinking, yeah, you. Jessica. You know? <laughs> uh, sorry if I ever did that. But, um, you know, it's, it's looking at this, that sometimes people can do the same thing in prayer. Where they're looking at God, but they're not really looking at God. Uh, they pray to God, but they don't actually believe what they're saying. Mm. They direct their words to God, but there is no change in heart. Have you ever heard a conversation or a prayer like this? God, there is nothing below you. You are in control of the weather. You have created the mountains. All of power is within your hands. God, 
can you please help me get a job? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, if, if, if you can pull some strings, God, if you can you know, move the cosmos. Like, they, don't, they don't really understand. You've forgotten the whole beginning part of your prayer. Ooh. You have taken, you, you looked at God, but then you started to look back at yourself. And that's what people do all the time. Is that this guy, this, this king, he knew his proportions. He realized that God was so much bigger than this army. And it allowed him to just say, hey, let's just sing before them. Mm. We, have, we have complete victory. Guys, I just pray to a God that has all the power in the world. This army means nothing to him. If your proportions are off, you need to go back and check your numbers in prayer. Go back and see how much bigger God is to your little prayers or your little requests that you're trying to give to him. When you get this right, you can be like Judah, just singing before the battlefield. So you remember that what he, remembering what God has done in the past will allow you to see his ability in the future. Even going back in your life and remembering all the prayers that God has already previously answered. And remembering them how, how he, even those times, you got to remind yourself that those times where he came in at the very last moment and achieved that prayer, you got to remind yourself of that. That we are not on our own timeline, but on God's timeline. But I know when this, every single time, it kind of helped me feel what, what we can feel sometimes. Is every single time I ever say to Tegan, hey, check this out. She already starts to know and prepare herself that I'm about to do something weird. Uh, you know, do a cartwheel in the, in the living room or whatever, right? She already, whenever I say, check this out, she's already like, well, he's about to do something I don't like. Uh, and it can kind of be the same thing. We can have the same reaction when God starts to tell us, hey, be faithful. I'm like, oh, dang it, you're already preparing yourself. I don't think I'm going to like what's about to happen. <laughs> you're like, well, hey, be faithful. But we got to start preparing ourselves for the opposite. Yeah. Wow, this is about, something about uh, amazing is about to happen. Because when you focus on God, God is going to focus on you. Yeah. And you know it's true because it's in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> See, in conclusion, guys, I want to help convince you and understand that prayer is not a waste of our time. Yeah. That when you pray with a whole heart and your eyes set on God, that prayer really works. And then there are victories that are already ours. But we just have to bring those victories to allow God to fight them in the yeah. And to allow prayer to focus on the things that we need to fight for, that God has given us enough strength to fight for. And that is when we can see victories in our lives. Thank you very much. Come on.